911, what's the nature of your emergency? Good morning, police, fire, military, and families, and to everybody who is listening in on the Tactical Living Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Walton, and I am joined with Mr. Kirk Lawless. Kirk, how are you? I'm fine. Good morning. How are you? I have to... I, oh, I'm good. Really good. The sun is coming up. Where I'm facing right now is to the south, and I can see the, the sun rays just coming over these mountains, so it is definitely an amazing morning. Thank you for asking. And I, I have to ask you, Kirk, was there one day where... There was a uniform that said Officer Lawless on it. Oh, sure. Yeah, for uh, I wore a uniform on and off for uh, 14 years. So 28 years, I was 14 years in uniform and 14 years in a suit. Well, suit or leather jacket and dirty pants and crappy hat. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell it good morning good morning can you tell us a little bit about your career then in law enforcement uh yeah i started out in a, a small municipality called jennings which is uh border st louis city proper on the north side um i started out there as a reserve cop and then jumped into a seat in a radio room because it paid a little more money than well, reserve cops don't get paid at all. So I took a spot as a dispatcher for about a year before I got commissioned and sent to the police academy. And then about a year, a year on the street, I transferred to my final destination, which is called Florissant, which is further away from St. Louis City proper, uh, right next to Ferguson, Missouri. I mean, everybody pretty much knows where Ferguson is, but that's 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 where that's where I landed. So, uh, pretty much a local boy. I've I've lived in this area my entire life. So, very cool. Good morning, you guys. No makeup this morning. I'm definitely wearing makeup. Maybe he's talking to you, Kirk. <laughs> and uh, oh. this morning, to hey. whoever is um. <laughs> Whoever is the most engaged on this thread, I'm going to be sending you a two pack of some tactical flashlights that I found on Amazon that look pretty awesome. And Kirk, yesterday you and I were talking a little bit and we were talking about people just being assholes. And I have seen, especially post COVID, that there just seems to be an abundance of assholes. Like people just are genuinely not happy. And as it relates to your career in law enforcement, I'm just wondering what are some of the dynamic shifts and things that you've seen change from from how the the career might be now versus how it once was since you have such a long standing career in law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I still keep my hand in the game even though my career got cut short, not by me, but by my former department. Um, well, I joked around yesterday that when, when I came on a job, our tasers were made of wood. So I am a dinosaur. We didn't, we didn't have all, all the technology, but we also had, um, you know, what are you? Uh, let them hate so long as they fear that that's a, a kind of a good analogy of what I think police work needs to turn back into. Uh, when I was a young cop, two things you didn't want to see when you were a bad guy, you didn't want to see a car pull up with that license plate on it. And you didn't want to see a police car with that license plate on it when you were be when you're being an asshole mm -hmm. either one of those plates would come with some solid police work that would land you in jail and many times it was uh in jail um after a trip to the emergency room um, it, it may sound kind of harsh, but in the areas that I, when I, when I was brought up as a baby policeman, when my skull hadn't completely formed yet, like a baby, uh, that's just the way it was. People didn't want to go to jail. They still don't want to go to jail, but they didn't want to go to jail 
looking good. They had to fight. They had to fight the police. They have some status when they got into the system. If they, you know, if you if you locked a guy up on a serious felony and he didn't choose to openly resist, and by that means trying to kick your ass, and he went into jail and he didn't have a bandage on his head, then everybody would think he was a snitch. Mm-hmm. So, so it was almost. Yeah. It was like the rule of the street, you know, it's like, I'm going, but you have to, we have to fight first. So, Yeah. Uh, I, I like wood tasers. I know that. Isn't that funny? Good morning, you guys. And for everybody who's listening, I'm wondering what your perception of law enforcement was when you were raised. And that's such a great point, Kirk, because Clint and I talk about this a lot and baby policemen when my head wasn't fully formed yet. I love it. I know that's funny. And Clint and I talk about how when we were younger, our folks taught us that we needed to respect authority. We needed to respect the law. And it seems as though we're having the society be raised where, where kids are being taught that they need to fear the police. And there's this negative and false narrative that's being played out in the media. And I'm just wondering, why do you think that change has taken place? Well, I think I think it's a couple things. I think it's the overall breakdown of the family unit. Uh, you know, the 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 parents don't raise their children, and in households. So I'm I'm what am I? How old am I? I'm, I'll I'll be I'll be fifty twelve in July. So I'll be sixty two in July. <laughs> uh, if you had kids that were kind of lost in the systems and maybe had a crappy family life, that's when the school would step in and kind of nurture the kid or teach them some, some thing, basic rules. As we talked before the rule, number one, don't be a dick. That's, that's, that's the rule that, that, you know, that's, that everybody should live by. No, the, um, um, I do get a little, I get a little sidetracked sometimes because of the stuff I deal with. Um, so bear with me if I just kind of see a rabbit and chase it for a couple minutes. Um, so the schools would kind of pick up what the parents left off. But I think all these celebrities and politicians that talk about, oh, I think I have PTSD from dealing or watching these horrible police beatdowns and things like that. It's total, it's total bullshit. I mean, it, it really is. It's just a cop out. You know, the, the kids raise themselves or they're raised by the television. They don't respect their parents. So they're not going to listen to their parents. They're not going to listen to the teachers and they're not going to listen to the cops. You know, when I was a kid, we were taught to respect the cops. Uh, my, my uh, grandfather was a U.S. Marshal in uh, the city of St. Louis. And his job was if somebody got sent to the walls uh, the big prison, the big bad prison uh, in Jefferson City, he would handcuff the guy to his wrist and he'd take him to the train station and he would deliver him to the doors of the prison. So there were always cops around my my dad's family. And then as we grew up, then yes, there were still um, people that we knew in the business but when these people talk like you former president, former president's wife saying that, you know, it's really, you know, I had to have that talk, the talk. <laughs> I had to talk. Okay. Well, you know what? Go ahead and have the talk, but it's bullshit because every parent that gives, gives a crap about their kid should have that talk. My great, my grandfather who grew, you know, he worked in a, in a rough area. And, you know, would take he'd take guys to Jefferson City so they could stretch their neck when they still hung people. So he had that talk with his six sons and one daughter. He didn't have to worry about the daughter, but he probably had to worry about his six sons not going out there doing stupid shit. So he had the talk. So when me and my brother got into the age where we could go out and do stupid shit, we got the talk. And then when I got married and had children, um, my kids got to talk. So, I mean, to, to say that it was just so horrible that they had to have the talk with their kids about what to do during a car stop. And, you know, I don't want to get a bullet in the back of my head. 
There's no cops out there that are going to pull somebody over just because they're a different flavor of the day than I am and put a bullet in their head. There's a lot. I mean, there, there's so much that goes along with you pulling the trigger and shooting at somebody or shooting somebody or shooting and killing somebody. There's a whole lot of baggage that comes with that. And nobody gets up in the morning and said, you know what? I'm indiscriminately going to wake up and put my uniform on or my, you know, what I guess they would refer to as my killing suit when I was a detective right. and go out there and just blast some guy just because it's fun, because it's not fun, you know, because when you do shoot at somebody, uh, most generally they're shooting at you. Or if you do shoot someone and kill them, which I've had to do that, uh, it's not because it's fun and say, Hey, that, you know what? This is going to be really cool. It's going to be, no, don't, I don't want you to, I don't want you to kill me. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot you. And if you die, that's on you. It's not on me. I'm going, I want to go home. You know, you, you have, you're half my size and a third of my age and you can run like a gazelle, get after it, start hopping fences. Don't, don't pull a pistol on me and play West Texas gunfighter because you'll die that death on the cold cement or the hot cement. You know, it's just, yeah, and, you know, Kirk, you, I love having such a candid conversation with you. And that's because typically people are afraid to have these conversations because they fear the number one fear in America, which is being called a racist. And I think you hit the nail on the head and here, uh, where was it? Bob said, Image is everything for bad guys. Always and still do respect all Leos. Ashley said there is so much loss of support and respect. People don't seem to have morals. And yeah, sh they're sharing mistruths. Find a policeman was always the word of caution that we got. So they're right there. That's exactly what you said, Kirk. When having that talk, the, the talk that we all should receive at one point in our life, I believe that the dynamics of the variation of those talks that are now being received, especially in modern day, it, it's very different. And what Bob said was that we we find a policeman was always a word of caution that we got. So you're exactly right because that's the same talk that I received was if you're in if you're in danger, you need to seek out law enforcement. And also this is the proper protocol when law enforcement seeks out you for some unintended reason. And I think that the narrative, exactly what you just explained, Kirk, of creating this like dangerous situation before it's even taken place, you're already planting a negative connotation and a negative seed in the mind of, of somebody who's receiving a talk along the lines of, if you get pulled over by a cop, they immediately want to kill you. So you need to already have your guard put up and then protect your life. Like that's complete bullshit. Actually, you are absolutely right. And I, I'm wondering then, because I know a lot of officers who have started to question their career in law enforcement. So what advice would you maybe have, Kirk, that you've been able to carry with you with all of your experience to those officers who still are out there on the streets every day? Well, you know, like I said, I try to keep my hand in the game. I write I write for the Blue Magazine on a regular basis, and uh, I do some things for Cop Blue and Law Enforcement Today. So I keep my hand in the game. I have access to recruits at one of the police academies. I'm banned at one of the police academies because uh, I went in and told the story or nightmare of, you know, what what I went through and how my department treated me after I shot and killed a guy. Um, I, I think there will come a point where the people, um, the law-abiding citizens, way, way outnumber the assholes that hate us. I mean, that's fact. But the mainstream media, that's not the narrative that fits. They want blood in the streets. If it, if it bleeds, it leads. They, they would love a race war. Uh, they're spoiling for it. And, you know, in, in police work, it's like, does race come into play? Yes. And how does it come into play? Well, if I'm going to a call for, let's say, an armed robbery, race comes into play because there's people in cars and there's people on foot. And I want to know, first of all, what I'm looking for. And the, and the main thing that comes into play first is race. So if I'm mm -hmm. looking for a white bank robber, 
I don't care about what a, a, a black man running down the street is doing. He's mm -hmm. totally out of it or an Asian guy or a, a lady. I, you know, I want to know, I want to know if I roll up on a burglary scene, I might ask the dispatcher, do you, you know, do you, is, does the caller sound African-American? I mean, and sometimes that, you know, whatever, you know, some, sometimes you might think you're talking to an African-American or a Latino when you get there and the guy's more transparent than I am. He's just pasty white. And that's, but, but, you know, we need, we need some information, you know, if it keeps up like this, it's going to be a bank got Rob. What's a suspect look like? Well, all we can tell you is it's, it's a guy and he's wearing clothes. Really? I mean, you know, if they say, oh, he's, he's, he's a white guy. Oh, you're racist. You, you labeled that yeah. guy. Well, I didn't mm -hmm. label him. He's a bank robber for crying out loud, but I need a little more information. At some point in time, I think it's going to go full circle and people are getting, people are getting tired. I mean, I've, I've top friends all over the country and I did look at your page and that some of the people that have been on your show are personal friends of mine. Gwen Grimes, who lives in Alaska, Eddie Richardson. Um, I didn't, I didn't go through the whole list, but I mean, we all kind of run in these same circles. And uh, at, at one point in time, people are going to say, you know what? You know, I'm glad they went with the, I, I'm glad they want body cameras because the body cameras exonerate more cops and bags them. And that was put mm -hmm. on to bag them just like the in dash cameras that 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 was wasn't they they flew it under the flag of providing for the safety of the officer it's really not it's just another tool that they use that they're going to jam it well, basically they're going to jam it in your ass if they can to protect their own job the bosses don't care about the cops and i tell the recruits when i talk to them you're kind of on your own in 10 years, I mean, look at look at Baltimore, look at Chicago. Now, St. Louis, we're number one in murders. And I think that's just because we're better shots. Chicago kills or mm -hmm. shoot. Chicago shoots a heck of a lot more people, but they need to spend more time at the range because they're not dropping them like we are down here in St. Louis. You know, so you talk about the Wild West. The Wild West was a Girl Scout jamboree compared to what goes on in the streets all across America now. And I, I think at some point people are going to say, hey, you know, we're tired of this. Can you can you dust off some of these dinosaurs and give them those wooden tasers and let them go out there and do their work the way it's meant to be? I mean, I don't want to get hit in the head with a nightstick. I've seen it. I've I've done it. I don't I don't I don't want to be the recipient of that. And how do you not be the recipient of that? Well, one, you don't be a dick. And people are gonna get tired of it. I mean, look at the people in Seattle. I have relatives and friends that live in Seattle and, and in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, where, you know, it, it is the, this is a great social experiment. What's it gonna be like without police? There it is right there. It's complete mayhem. You know, the, the, the police surrendered their police precinct. I mean, really? You know, when I was a baby policeman, if they said, hey, boys are going to attack the police department and run us out of here, huh, we'd be like, game on. Good luck with that. You know, you know, they pay us money to provide a service and we're ready to provide that service. You want to take the police station? Come and come and get it, and we'll see how it works out for you. Uh, now it's just turn tail and run, and don't don't hurt anybody's feelings, and don't talk bad to people. I would get get on your knees with them and beg for forgiveness I mean, for shit you didn't do. And it yeah, it, it, it's it's sickening. I actually went I went to a local protest at, at my department, and I. I People can, I won't even mention the name of the department, but if people Google search me, they'll figure it out. And I won't name names, but I will tell you that one night I went up to the protest two times to watch from a distance. And the first night 
was a freaking embarrassment because I saw on the front line guys that were taking bricks and bottles and fireworks being shot at them and buckets of piss thrown at them. And there's guys from every agencies because we all help each other out in St. Louis. So you got big, big entities. You got St. Louis city, like about 1400 cops or less. St. Louis County has about 800 something. And then there's 95 municipalities. We had like a hundred and then they can run anywhere from 30, 40, five guys working out of grandma's basement in some house, uh, you know, but when we need help, we get on the phone and everybody sends who they can to help. Well, while these guys are getting pelted with brick bats and bottles and, and I saw a guy that from my department wearing a white shirt, didn't go out and stand on the front line. He came slinking out of the building and watched the carnage from the bushes. And I have, I have that, I have that on videotape because I even waved to the guy and I was like, what the actual shit? Why, why are guys from other departments taking bricks to the head and you're hiding in the bushes? That's embarrassing. The next day I went up during, um, it was broad daylight and, and I was at least 150 yards away from the action and I had, I had my son with me. And uh, he, he's he's a grown man, and in Missouri, we're oh, we you're allowed constitutional carry. I mean, I can carry a gun anywhere in the country because I'm a retired cop. But my son's a grown man, and he can carry a gun. And we went up there because it just it's just the way it is now. I mean, there there's so much just random shootings. I mean, drive they in in St. Louis City, the main highways that go like from St. Louis Arch all the way out from the Mississippi river all the way to the Missouri river during the day, it's like a shooting gallery, rolling gun battles in broad daylight. Hmm. So we stood and watched the show and a couple guys that were obviously with the protesters, you know, came 